Welcome to the Top Business Leader Show, powered by Rise 25 Media. We feature top founders, executives, and business leaders from all over the world. Hello, listeners. I'm Bela Musitz, the host for this episode of the Top Business Leaders Podcast, where we feature CEOs, entrepreneurs, and top leaders in the business world. This episode is brought to you by Rise 25. We help B2B businesses cultivate and reach their dream relationships and connect with more clients, more referrals, and strategic partnerships to get your business return on investment through Done For You podcast. If you have a B2B business and want to build great relationships, there is no better way than to profile the people and companies you admire on your podcast. To learn more, go to rise25.com or email us at support at rise25media.com. Today's guest on the podcast is Steve Robotham. He is a former Olympic medalist. Steve's current passion is as a managing director at Navigator Technology, where he is building a global marketing technology business. Welcome to the podcast, Steve. Thank you for having me. Great. So I, I got to ask you about the Olympic thing. So uh, elaborate. Tell us uh, what what that is. Yeah, in my former life, uh, I was an Olympic athlete. Very fortunate to compete at two Olympic Games in Beijing, two thousand eight, and my home games in twenty twelve, which was obviously very special. Medaled in in Beijing, got a got a, a bronze medal, so the least shiny one, but um, uh, and probably would have preferred to have had it the other way around, where I, that would happen in London. But as I say, very fortunate. Uh, and got got spat out at, and retired at, at the age of the grand age of thirty, and had to reinvent myself and uh, recreate a, a completely new life for myself. At, at, as I say, at a young age. So, yeah, it does seem some time ago. I actually got messaged by my rowing partner today. Fifteen years uh, since the medal in Beijing. So yeah, nearly quite some time. So you were you were a rower. I was a rower, yeah. So for those in North America, it's crew, yeah, but a rower, yeah. yeah. And a two-person, one-person, four-person? Uh, Beijing, there was two of us, yeah, and then London, four. So, yeah, not quite good enough to do it on my own, so I relied on other people to help me go faster. Yeah, yeah. I've always wondered, you know, I've seen those on TV uh, numerous times, watching the Olympics. How fast do you guys go? Yeah. relatively slow when you actually when you see it in 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 action live uh obviously due to it being a water and a friction and stuff like that um i think it's like four to five meters per second so or whatever that translates in miles per hour but basically if you watch the uh all the coaches cycling on the bank beside us yes they're barely pedaling so it's not that fast well it always it always impressed me as as being pretty fast because I, I did see the coaches pedaling and I'm going, okay. it, you know, they're, they're on a bike. They're not running. Yeah. They're not jogging. Yeah, next yeah. To you. No, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it, and obviously it's not through lack of effort from our standpoint either. Like we're doing yeah. everything we can to go as fast as we can. Yeah. So that's impressive, right? I mean, you're clearly driven you're motivated. You, 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 you know how to apply yourself. So you, you're done, right? Your yeah. career's over. So talk a little bit about, okay, now what? How did you? How did you sort of sort through that and think through that process? Yeah, so it was it was a crazy and a and a lot longer process than I had anticipated. You know, um, I remember we were walking out of the athletes' village in the London Games, and uh, we were just going to get the underground, the tube, the metro back to our where I lived in in West London. Um, and there was this big chauffeur-driven car that was like transported all the dignitaries around and they were like hey do you want to lift home and I was like yeah cool so we're in the back drinking champagne um and then I got dropped off at my house um and I was just standing there on the pavement and I it hit me like a steam train and it was like that's it that's, I'm done like that and I was just in the in my front room having a cup of tea with hopefully touch wood a lot of my life left in me um but what happened at the time is i thought all of my identity and my purpose had been completely removed because it was linked with me being a rower me being an olympic athlete that's who i was i was steve the olympic athlete um and i struggled and i'm not afraid to say that it took me three to four years um I actually went through some therapy because of it, because my wife had had enough of me and I'd had enough of me and uh, I really wasn't the person that I wanted to be. 
And even today, there's episodes where I get angry and resentful or reflective on, on what happened. And I didn't quite obviously achieve what I set out to achieve with a gold medal. Um, and, and and yeah, you almost, it's like when you come out of college or something like that, and, or, you know, when you're 15 and someone goes, what do you, what is it you want to do? And I was like, I just, I've just cut, lived my dream. I've had 11 years and I did it for 11 years full time and 11 years of fulfilling my dream being exactly who I wanted to be. Um, and it's not like business where, you know, it, business a lot requires your brain. This is, requires a huge amount of your body. So at 30 to 35, whatever it is around that age, you're done. You can't physically perform at those level, those levels anymore. So, you know, you want to do it. You want to carry on. You want it to last for 30, 40 years, and it doesn't. And and as I say, complete loss of identity. It took me some time to realize that you're not, I, you, you're not, you know, um, you know who you are is not dictated by your by your title or a label or what others think of you who you are is how you turn up in the morning how you feel and how you make other people feel about you at the time so um i can see that now but at the time it was it was tough real tough yeah yeah well said it it, it sounds like it was a real struggle and it's one of the things that has always intrigued me about uh, certain professions or certain sport if you will, sports sports is a profession. Yeah. Uh, that that when you stop doing that, you're it's very challenging to transition transition to something else because there isn't anything really like it very much. Yeah. And and other than knowing that the person is highly motivated, highly driven, right? They they have they have wonderful characteristics, but they may not have the skills. Whereas if you're in a in some business profession, oftentimes you know, the first five years of your career builds on, Bill helps you build the next five years, which then helps yeah. you build the next five years. And it really doesn't off, sometimes they spit you out at the end too, but <laughs> you know, you, you often come out of there with a set of skills that are sort of marketable in other avenues, but you know, going into the military or, yeah. you know, I mean, there's a lot of examples as uh, sports, certainly. Um, and in particularly in those types of professions where you where you're not going to make a lot of money right you're not yeah. you're you're not a football or as you guys say football as we say soccer mm -hmm. player so you're not making 10 million pounds a year so, so you, you know you you, you gotta you gotta figure out something so yeah that's that's a, it's it's i'm glad you sort of opened up about that because i've often thought about how people yeah. make that transition very, very yeah amazing. if you if you think about it as a venn diagram you've basically got a circle which is everything you you're capable of or who you are or who you want to be and then sport for me fit over and neatly right on top of that and and the realization when you come out of sport particularly into the world of business is that you you're never going to achieve that again so i often think about how you know jk rowling felt after writing harry potter or how <laughs> the rolling stones after right. you know you're never you have to accept there's a degree of acceptance that you're never ever going to be able to replicate that what you had and there's some like mourning. There's a you, there's almost like there's a loss uh, because of that acceptance. The the thing for me that enabled me to transition through it was that I moved from a place where it was all about me. It was my performance, my body, my mind. Uh, the world revolved around me. Into a place, into a, a place of work, into into a business where. I get my fulfillment through helping others from helping them fulfill their potential as a leader within a business. And actually that is giving me a whole different type of fulfillment and enjoyment. And one that, you know, I really am determined to, to succeed at. Um, and it's getting close to that, that Venn diagram, but it's still not quite there yet. And I think, yeah, that's, yeah. that's really why a lot of us struggle. Yeah. Super. So uh, was Navigator the first thing you, you sort of dove into? Not at all. No, I came out of university or for you guys college and, and I'd done economics. So like most people who did economics thought they were going to go into the city and earn mega bucks in investment banking and stuff like that. And I found myself um, in, in investments and straight after the London Olympics and I was sitting in an office looking out the window going, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> like, I can't cope with this. So I, I, I walked away from that. I quit. I took a couple of months out. Um, I actually went up and put up wind farms, so wind turbines for a big German uh, manufacturing business called Siemens. 
and I was in the commercial aspect of that and that was kind of like calmed me down a lot as a human being um and kind of reintegrated me with my family I had a young kid at the time um and then I got a phone call from a, a recruitment agency that hires people into sport uh or from sport into business sorry um and I'd been working through them, you know, trying to get into Goldman Sachs and Deutsche Bank, et cetera. And, and he, this guy said, look, Steve, I, uh, I appreciate this isn't the profession that you that you may well have wanted to choose or chosen. But um, we met this guy at an event, this guy called Simon, and, and he wants to see what a sports person can, can do in his business. So he wants to he wants to meet you. And it was in media and travel media at the time. So the business that I'm currently in um, for 20, the last 27 years has produced in-flight magazines. So if you're flying United or, or American, et cetera, we do, we do those magazines. At the time, we did as well. And Simon really was, uh, was going to let me be who I wanted to be uh, and affect as much positive impact on his business as possible and give me an environment where I could perform, which, which obviously resonated with me greatly. But I never woke up and thought, Christ, I should be in in travel or, or, or travel media particularly, but it's more importantly the environment that, that nurtures people's potential and, and value. And, and that's that's the business that I've been in uh, all the way through to the pandemic. We were, as I say, the magazine people and the pandemic hit and our lights got turned off. And the business yeah. that stands here today is completely different to the one that was there in 2019. Yeah. So let's let's talk about that a little bit, kind of that transition uh, and other sort of ending, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Things things are going great. You're happy, and then boom, the pandemic hits, and sort of the world changed. And now it's it's another transition for Steve. So talk through that and and how you coped with that, and and sort of where you ended up with Navigator. Yeah. So in in uh, we, we're owned by this quite large American new, uh, business called um, called Stagwell, which is Nasdaq listed. Stagwell Bought Inc. is the business that Navigator exists within. Stagwell bought Inc. in 2018, and I remember the deal was done very early in the early hours of the morning in London. And uh, the very next morning, Simon, the CEO at the time, uh, him and I had coffee, and I basically told him his business was a pile of crap. And it was, uh, to, to quote directly what I said, we're playing in a puddle when there's an ocean of opportunity. And he had had about 33 minutes of sleep, and he was like, thank you very much for that, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? And and I had a vision for we a vision for the business ideas of where I thought it could be playing, um, and uh, and and a way to get there. Right. So we spent the last the the, the next year or so looking into other expanding the business, growing, etc. Obviously, in, in twenty twenty, our lights got turned out. We got hit by a nuclear missile. We're in travel. And yeah, um, our revenue is based on advertising sales, of which was zero. So for the first six, seven months of the pandemic, our turnover went from a hundred million dollars to literally nothing, not not a single dollar dime coming through the through the front door. And in late 2019, we had picked up this technology, which is now the Navigator technology, uh, which we can talk a little bit about. But um, the kind of people that we are is that when we are faced with adversity um such as what we what we found ourselves in in early 2020 we we doubled down on our conviction and belief and the belief was that this business could be incredibly successful navigator um and it could transform uh the business that we we're in, within uh, in the future so we invested so whilst we were hemorrhaging money we actually invested more money in it because we believed in the vision that we'd created pre-pandemic um, and we made a promise. I remember standing there in front of the entire business saying to them, we will come out of this pandemic stronger than we went in it. And at the time, if I'm candid, I had literally no idea how, how we were going to do that at the time. But I knew who we were and the type of people we were were incredibly resourceful. And I can proudly say that's exactly what we've done. And the business is stronger as a result of, of what we did during that period of time. Um, and yeah, we had a pandemic baby in, in in the early part of 2020. We gave birth to Navigator, and it's been a, it's been some journey to this point, and no doubt there's more to come. But uh, it's been fun in the most part. Excellent. So, talk a little bit more specifically about Navigator and what you guys do. Sure, we effectively um, we effectively connect brands with their customer, and, and that's really it for me. It's really boiling it down to the fundamentals of marketing. 
I think we live in a world in general outside of 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 marketing that is uh, that is highly overcomplicated. And actually, if we boil it down to the to the raw basics and do those well, then we generally get good results. So, really, for me, the fundamental of marketing is placing your brand in front of your potential customer, and that's it. There's no more to it than that. Um, you know, we, we I saw we, we, the thinking was that. When the internet was born, you know, we were made all of these promises that finally we didn't have to waste advertising dollars by putting a billboard by the side of the road and wasting our money on magazine advertising or TV or whatever it might be, because the internet was going to know everything about your customer and know exactly what they're doing, where they are, et cetera, and place your brand in front of it. And, and actually, the reality that stands here today is completely different to that, whereby we live in a world of mass online marketing hoping that you're going to reach the right person at the right time. Uh, and it is hope in a lot of respects. So I just saw a way where we could solve this problem during the pandemic. Um, and, and we work with the world's biggest airlines and big, biggest travel booking platforms and are able to access their first party data. So you make a flight search, flight booking, and we get to leverage that. The innovation that we brought to market was how we access that. We don't. We we believe in ethical data access, so we don't believe it's right that businesses pass and resell your data, and it ends up with fifteen different hands touching it, etc. So, with our innovation and our solution, the airlines and travel booking platforms get to own their data at all points, and they never ever pass it to us, which is critical. And I think that's allowed us to scale so quickly. Um, and then we go out there and we find partner advertising partners that that want to place their brand in front of their potential customer. So think. Uh, uh, in New York hotel, um, placing their brand in front of a customer who's just made a flight search into New York. Right, that's as simple as that. And and we're a global business, so we've got offices in Miami, in New York, in in London, Singapore, and Kuala Lumpur, um, and data partners in every single continent. And probably because of who I am and how stupid I think, um, we went global straight away. <laughs> In hindsight, probably a proof of concept in one region, so I didn't have to work three different, four different time zones. But, but hey, uh, as I say, it's a lot of fun, and, and I've I've got to learn a lot about about building a business. Yeah, yeah. So uh, conceptually, I think I understand what you said, right? I I'm doing a search on a on an airline booking site, and I'm searching for flights to London. Yeah. And I book one and then lo and behold, I'm, I'm going to get some adverts for hotels in London. So conceptually, that sounds pretty simple. What's is there like a secret sauce that makes that work? Yeah, well, you, we rely, you know, we will serve you an ad on, on Facebook, Instagram or Google or TikTok, you know, so it's all what we call off site. So, yeah. Like you know, a couple of hours later, you go onto your Facebook feed, you'll see an ad for that hotel in London. Yeah. Um, the 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 magic happens on the site, the way you're making that search or booking, that you give that business permission to use their data to to market to you, and 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 they're able to anonymous like store your anonymized customer data, so that you're you're anonymous at all points, and we just come in and 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 create those custom audiences and, and highly targeted campaigns and, and create value for our advertising partners. And that, and again, you know, our business is about serving our clients and the, the more, the more that we serve them, the more that we succeed and, and the value of the data that we have access to enables to, to create some, some magic. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I can imagine uh, if, if you go on a sales call and, and you're at a, you know, Marriott, or you know a Hilton chain, and you yeah. and you're trying to sell them this opportunity, and you know you make your pitch, you you walk out of the the president's office, and you see sitting in the waiting room is your competition <laughs> getting ready to go in and make their pitch. So what's sort of the difference? What what's what separates you guys or distinguishes you from the competition? Because it seems like a very crowded space. Yeah, absolutely. I think you know, I think data is more valuable than oil now. I think that's the the official quote that's going around. So everyone's fighting over knowing as much as they can about yeah. us and and selling that as much as they can to whoever will purchase it for whatever price. So as you're right, so it, it's a crowded market space. Um, there's some technological differences um, whereby our competitors do get past your your data. Um, which again we don't think is okay, and we'll stand by our business. We're not here to to 
to slander anything anyone else's businesses i think we can both live in the same space but but fundamentally that's the big technological difference and what i've what i've tried to do is build a business in the right way and i think there's a huge cultural di- difference that i'm again doing business the right way built on trust and transparency servicing our clients so it's not about how much money we can make from our clients it's how well we can serve them and if we can Mm. create value then we can make some money at the same time i think there's an energy a vibe to our business we're an incredibly agile business and that's tough to maintain when you start scaling but i want a business which is consistently agile and open to opportunity i want our eyes our ears and our minds open at all points so that when opportunity comes our way we're able to benefit from that i think as our competitors have grown they've become a bit more uh a bit more muted when it comes to that and a bit more traditional in their thinking um so yeah we 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 want a cultural difference and a, an energy and vibe to us but also there is a there is a key technological difference and in the age of cookie deprecation and 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 a lot of things that you're seeing in the market with with apple and safari and and app tracking etc we've we've built what we believe to be a a long-term solution to an ever-increasing problem that our competitors will be struggling with big time yeah yeah you talked a little bit about culture there um so let me ask you a question as you think about hiring people into your organization what are some of the and and you know, what are some of the key characteristics you look for to make sure that they fit into the culture you have? Yes, a great question because it's so important to me, and I feel that I'm a real custodian of that culture. So, um, I, I basically I stole um, the Nike Ten Commandments. I don't know whether you've seen it, but obviously when they started, they said this is the way that we're going to operate our business. So I I stole that and I I wrote our own constitution. Um, and point 10 of our constitution, I've, funnily enough, I've got it in front of me, was you weren't hired for what you did. You were hired for who you are. Be you. We celebrate and reward each other for the value we each bring. And, and that's the ethos that we've got in our business. We're a non-hierarchical business. So we have a business that's based on responsibility. And we bring people into the business who we feel are, are great learners, who are going to not just fit into our culture. I don't believe in that phrase. It's more add to our culture, mm. um, help us achieve and, and want to be significant. They get to add their piece. I had a, you know, we've got a head of data as a 24 year old woman um, who, who's, you know, been here for a, a year and, and, and just absolutely smashed it. And she's rocked it. And, and she's a head of a global department and that's incredible. And I want, to reward that value and, and for her to be able to be significant. And she was in here with like three or four ideas today saying we should do this. And it's like, brilliant, let's go. And, and that's again where I get my kicks out of. But fundamentally, it's who they are as a human being um, and whether they want to go on this journey with us because we, we are different and we don't do things necessarily the traditional way. Um, and that's not for everyone, right? And, and we're okay with that. But yeah, it's more about inherently whether you've got that drive, that ambition, that, that, um, appetite for learning and growth and if you do we can teach you anything right it's i can't teach you fundamentally right. who you are right right yeah that goes back to sort of what we were talking about earlier about uh athletes you know we yeah. we know you're driven we know you're motivated <laughs> you have certain characteristics that are important in anything that you do yeah. so uh, it's getting those core characteristics and and making sure the person has those and i like the way you said not fitting into our culture, but adding to our culture. I think yeah. you're one of the first people I've ever heard say that. So uh, that was that was really nice. So uh, I'm going to start thinking about wrapping this up a little bit. Uh, what words of advice would you give to someone who is considering starting their own business? Other than don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, other, other than don't do it. Yeah. Exactly. Um. I think uh, there's been some real key moments in my life. Um, I I actually got dropped from the the national rowing team just before the Athens Olympics. That was one, the, the pandemic from a business perspective, and and a few others. Yeah, and and during periods of adversity or periods of like vulnerability, I guess, because when you're starting your own business, it's an incredibly vulnerable thing to do. What what I do is I look inside myself 
and I look to my conviction and I had a deep, deep sense of conviction that this was something that was quite special. And no matter what was thrown at me and no matter what doubts I may have had at the time or others have had of, of me, I was just convinced that it was the right thing to do. And, and I think you just let, let go and just do it. And, and, and that's, that's the that's the scary moment, but once you've done that, mm. it's an it's an incredible ride. You get massive highs, massive lows, and everything in between. But if you if I think again, I, I look back at other periods where I haven't let go, and I've been too cautious, and I've been too safe, and I've and I've wanted you know a safety net underneath me, and it just doesn't work out. And the moments in my life where I've just let go and gone, hey, I just back myself to find a way. And you just go for it and put yourself into it, then it's amazing. And and you know, even with the Olympic medal, when you build a business, no one's going to remember you, remember you for the money that you generated, for the value it was, for how many employees you had, for any job title. What you can't ever take away from someone, and you'll never be able to take away from me, if you, even if you take my medal away from me, is the feeling that I had by doing it, by achieving it. I, and I'll take that to my grave, and and that's the special thing. And I I I feel that within my soul, and and the way that I feel about biz, building this business and the pride that I have, no one will be able to take that away. And it's a really special thing to be able to do. And I'm again feel very privileged to to be on this journey and to be able to experience those kind of feelings and emotions. Wow! Very well said, Stephen. Very well articulated. That was just great advice. Thank you so much for sharing that. So uh, where can our listeners uh, go to find out more about Navigator? Uh, well, we're at, we've started to, we've just rebranded. So we're shouting as much as we can in the world at the moment. So obviously everyone's uh, shop, shop window is their website. So it's navigator.tech. Um, you can go with the same handle on LinkedIn, Instagram, et cetera. Um, anyone within the business, we were writing blogs and white papers around certain things. But yeah, please do find us at navigator.tech and, and come and follow all of our social channels. Um, it's a conversation rather than us telling people what they should be doing. Um, and we're very much in this world to learn as well. So um, yeah, uh, uh, please come and support us in our journey. Super, super. I will make sure that information is in the show notes. Please do. Uh, so, Stephen, is there something that I have not asked you uh, that I should have asked you or that you'd like to share with our listeners? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think you, you, what you've asked is, you know, is, is incredibly insightful and intuitive. Um, yeah, I think it's probably about the lessons that we've learned along the way and the insights that we can give others to that they're in their journey. And, and as you say, that I think the most insightful one was around, you know, to have any piece of advice for an entrepreneur other than don't do it. Um, so for me, it, it, it's, it's just about giving it a go and, 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 and realizing your potential. Um, so I value that being able to share my advice around that. Yeah. Great. Great. Well, Stephen, thank you so much for being a guest on the podcast. Uh, I really enjoyed our conversation. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate you having me. Thanks for listening to the Top Business Leaders Show, powered by Rise25. Visit rise25.com to check out more episodes of the show and to learn more about how you can start your own podcast.